Pujols is going home. You can tell Marte is not going anywhere. And your pal Sully is going to open up the mailbag. This is Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast we talk about all of Major League Baseball. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please, please, please call me Sully. On today's episode, which is being dropped on the 30th day of March 2022, we're almost in April, everyone. That means baseball is right around the corner. We'll talk about a couple of the moves that were made which basically were reunions, and I'm going to open up the mailbag. Essentially, read some of the comments, read some of the questions that some of you sent to me either via email, on Instagram, here on YouTube if you're watching here, on Twitter at Sully Baseball, all those places. And for those of you who have been listening to a bunch of these shows, thanks so much for making your first listen as we're available on all your free podcasting catchers. You can follow me on Twitter. Locked on MLB Pod, same handle for Instagram. My private account, you can look right there. There is at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast, Instagram, or follow us here on YouTube. And be sure to tell your smart device to play Locked on MLB or check out many other great shows on the Locked on Podcast Network, including Locked on Diamondbacks. My friend Miller Thomas, who joined Monday right here. Hey, you know, I don't always wear a hat here. I'm wearing uh, this is one from the Portland Diamond Project as they're working hard to bring a Major League Baseball team to the city of Portland, something I would love to see. I'm a huge fan of the city of Portland. I love Portland. I want Portland to get a Major League Baseball team, um, hopefully not at the expense of Oakland or at Tampa. Uh, baseball needs to expand by two teams, and I think a team should be in the Nashville, Charlotte region. I know there's a push to put a team in Montreal. I want a team in Portland. That's all there is. So that's um, showing my support there. I could take off the old hat because it does weird little shadow things there. Got a little bit of hat head right now. Hey, um, news that came about that was overshadowed by Will Smith. No, 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 not the closer of the Braves. No, 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 not the closer of the Dodgers. But the one thing that happened on the Oscars. Weird night. We win the Academy Award. And that's not the thing people about. But we're not going to be talking about that here. That event overshadowed the fact that Albert Pujols is coming back to the St. Louis Cardinals. Now, Albert Pujols needs, was it 21, 22 home run to get to 700? Jays and doing that are actually kind of sort of slim uh, because you know, Pujols, is, he's at the end of his career. I, I think it's great that he's going to finish his career with the St. Louis. I think the Cardinals are going to be a very, very good team and maybe – especially the Universal DH, Pujols will be able to get a little bit of playing time. It would be the ultimate cruelty to the <laughs> Angels if the Cardinals win the World Series this year. As they win the World Series in 2011, he signs a never-ending contract with the Angels to deliver something in Anaheim. He doesn't, then goes back to St. Louis and could potentially finish his career in the postseason. You know, if he hits 31 home runs, he will pass Stan Musial as the all-time Cardinals home run champion. I don't think that's happening. And hey, good for Stan the man for staying in the record books all those years, but also good that Pujols is going to retire a Cardinal. He's a Hall of Famer, first Bell Famer, one of the best offensive players of nation, delivered big in the postseason. Just ask Brad Lidge. Just ask the Rangers. We had three home runs in one game off of. Just ask the Astros in both 2004 and 2005. Pujols is a great player and um, you know, deserves to get the farewell send off that you know he deserves. Um, Cattell Marte is staying with the Diamondbacks. Boy, that's giving him something to talk about with Miller to, for next Monday when he comes. That's good news. And I like that. I like the fact that the Diamondbacks have signed him to a long term deal and are basically saying, hey, here's someone the Diamondback fans could root for, cling to right there. 
That's not too shabby. You know, bring him aboard. And, you know, there's, look, at the Diamondbacks obviously had a terrible season last year. But there's some talent on the team, some young talent that they're building up right now. And to have a star like Cattell Marte to be the centerpiece that you build around, it's not the dumbest thing in the world. You know, the Dodgers, all right, the Dodgers are the best team in baseball. But, you know, teams can fall. Teams going on a great run can fall. Philadelphia Phillies, anyone? And every year with an expanded playoffs, a team could sneak in to be one of the wild card teams. Nobody saw the Giants having the year they had this year. And every year, there's at least one or two teams that catches you off guard. So good for the Diamondbacks. And there's also talk that Jose Ramirez may be signing a long term deal with the Cleveland Indians. Ah! Guardians. I wanted the Indians to change their name. They did. I like the name Guardians. Not just because it's it's a cool sounding name, but it also has a connection to the city of Cleveland. And yet, I'm still going to say Indians, not because I'm one of these stubborn people, eh, they should never change. No, they should have changed it a long time ago. And yet, I'm just so conditioned to saying it. So forgive me, it's going to take about a year. It's going to take about a year. Anyway, uh, the Cleveland Guardians look like they want to keep Jose Ramirez. I think that's good. You know, you have the three lowest paid teams are the Baltimore Orioles, Pittsburgh Pirates, and the Guardians. Now, look at I do believe there should be a salary floor. There's no way you could have a full payroll being under $40 million in this day and age. You know, I'm not saying that money is going to buy all happiness, and I'm going to get to that in one of the, the messages that I got on the boards there. But for God's sakes... You got to be able to put a major league product on the field. And look at, okay, Baltimore's not going to contend this year. They've got a ton of prospects coming up through there. I can almost forgive them. Yeah, I wish they would lower their ticket prices. If you're going to put a minor league product on the field, you know, sell your tickets for minor league levels. Pirates, again, they're not a team that are going to contend this year. And so, all right, maybe it's wise for them to not, spend piles and piles of money and to sort of save up. They better spend eventually. But for the Guardians, it makes no sense. And here's why it doesn't make sense. The Guardians have good pitching. The Guardians actually have decent pitching depth, especially if Shane Bieber comes back. There are good pitchers on that team. In the bullpen was very good last year. And they have depth in their rotation as well. And, you know, Ramirez is an all-star bat. Uh, Reyes could hit. But the rest of their lineup is not very good. But they've done the hard part. they built a decent pitching staff. And instead of saying, hey, let's sell the team for parts and you, you can trade away all these young pitchers, take a look at the div- Now, you know, we talked about this, talked about the Minnesota Twins earlier. The Chicago White Sox, I think, are going to win the division. I think the Chicago White Sox are a good team and have as good a chance as anybody to go to the World Series in the American League. I'm not picking them. I'm Right now, I'm leaning to Toronto to being the American League champion, but it could very well be Chicago winning the division, going on a nice run. Next thing you know, Tony Russo is back in the World Series, maybe up against the Cardinals. Wouldn't that be weird? But the Guardians have the pitching that if the White Sox regress... They're the type of team that could, and the Tigers are not ready yet, and the Royals are rebuilding, and the Twins don't quite put it all together. A team with decent pitching is exactly the type of team that can win. And Paul Dolan, who runs the damn team, is sitting on a Scrooge McDuck pile of money, to paraphrase Jackie Cation, the brilliant comedian. and. With the team already sitting with a good pitching staff, all they need, you know, it's the same thing I did talk about the Marlins. Boy, there's a connection here for the World Series teams from 1997. If you just go around and you see who's available left as a free agent, okay, Conforto is actually a good player still available. Everyone left is basically, to use the parlance of the Sabermetrics crowd, a replacement level player. Well, then 
you know what? Let's say you raise the salary from, let's say you sign Conforto to what, 15, 16 million a year? I think he'd probably take that right now. And then you add like five players at a million dollars each. You add $20 million to a $35 million payroll, or 30, whatever it is. Okay, you're still not exactly turning them into the Dodgers spending wise. You're still, what, $70, $80 million, which is still would be a very low payroll for a contender. But with the same point I made about the Marlins and the point I made that we learned about the Atlanta Braves in last year's World Series is they put a major leaguer at every position. And with that, eventually they did a thing called win the World Series. Cleveland needs to win the World Series. Let me put something in perspective for you. Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York. Why am I bringing up the town of Rochester, New York? It's a medium-sized city in upstate New York. Minor League City. Nice town. I've been there before. Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York has had an NBA champion more recently than Cleveland has had a World Series champion. I'm guessing a lot of you did not know that Rochester, New York even had an NBA team. They did. In the 50s, the Rochester Royals. And the Rochester Royals eventually moved. And they bounced around and they wound up in, I believe it was in Cincinnati for a little bit. But eventually they found themselves in Kansas City where they became the Kansas City Kings. And then they became Sacramento Kings. And they're currently the Sacramento Kings. And for a little while it looked like they might have turned into the Seattle Kings. But they're staying in Sacramento. And it's kind of weird that there's an NBA team in Sacramento which is about the same size city for California as Rochester is in New York. But if you went to Rochester and you talked to the sports fans of Rochester, they've been able to brag about an NBA title more recently than a Cleveland World Series title. That's what they can do if they put a replacement player at every position. Sign Michael Conforto, who's out there. And you're not going to sign him. You don't even need to sign him a gigantic deal. And then ping, 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 go around, just fill your lineup with a major leaguer in every position. And maybe, just maybe, especially with Jose Romero sticking around, that could be a team that could score three or four runs a game. And with his pitching staff, that may be able to win more than they lose. I talk about breaking the bank. You have a chance to be a contender in not exactly the deepest division in baseball and roll the dice to give something to your fans so they can party as if they're in Rochester, New York. Hey, uh, before we get to some of the uh, the questions that we got from the you know, from YouTube and from Instagram, and from Twitter and everything, I just want to say thanks so much for making Locked On MLB your first listen. And guess what? Do you know what your second listen should be? Your second listen should be Locked On MLB Prospects, who are the terrific show that is hosted by a friend of the podcast, Mr. Sorry, Lindsey Crosby. Sorry, there's a little computer glitch if you saw me. Lindsey Crosby is an encyclopedia of MLB prospects, and he knows all about stars of tomorrow. And some of those stars of tomorrow could be playing a big part in some of these teams that are rebuilding. And when you see these trades going around, young players being sent left and right, guess what? Lindsey Crosby knows about it. Go to Locked On MLB Prospects. Find it on your podcatcher, podcast catcher, easy for you to say, and listen to the show. And do you want Lindsey Crosby is kind enough to be a quick guest right now, and he's going to be talking a little bit about athletic greens. Today's is up to you by our friends at at Athletic Greens. Our this this partner 
serve our has a product I use literally every single day. I started taking Athletic Greens because I have celiac disease. Autoimmune disorder, I can't digest, I can't eat. Um, um, so I have to go gluten-free, and it's not because I, you know, because I want to. It's because I have to. But to go along. Along with celiac disease, um, I to to absorb nutrients uh, both from food and from medicine, uh, and so I'm taking vitamins. I've been taking supplements for years, and I've always struggled to try to get you know the right amount of iron and things like that. And Athletic Greens has been a game changer for me. So Athletic Greens is 75 high quality. Quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that you get from one scoop. So you take one scoop of athletic greens, uh, you put it into eight to twelve ounces of water. I, I do cool water every morning, drink it on an empty stomach, and it absolutely goes well. It's less than one gram of sugar. Um, you know, it's it's there's no artificial stuff in there. It's all natural. Uh, and for me, very big, it's gluten-free, but if you need it, it's also dairy-free, it's vegan, it's paleo, it's keto-friendly. So it can help a lot of different people. And like I said, it's, it's, like, it, it's become the one thing I do every single day to take care of myself. Uh, so right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition especially as we head into flu and cold season. It's one scoop of a cup of water every day, and that's it. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash MLB Network to take for your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All righty. Are we back? We're back. I think of that. Thanks so much there. Now, let's go and read some of the messages that I've received. Um, first of all, let's let me open this up here. Uh, forgive me, I'm having a little bit of a uh, computer issue here, so I'm just going to plow through it right there. It is okay. Um, first of all, let's just talk to Rachel Wellington, who is one of my regular listeners. Sorry about that. Um, Rachel Wellington uh, wrote to me, I was listening to the podcast in the car. At the start, when you introduce yourself as Paul Francis Sullivan, I always say, but you got to call him Sully because you always wind up. And and saying that, for some reason, just makes me laugh how you just don't introduce yourself straight as Sully. All right, let me tell you something, Rachel. Uh, there's, there's a method to my madness about why I do the introduction the way that I always do. Um, and when I first started uh, both blogging and podcasting, over a decade ago, I just called myself Paul Sullivan. That's how I think of myself. You know, and you know, when I'm, if I met you, I'd say, hi, my name is Paul Sullivan. And, you know, some people call me Sully, some people call me Paul. All I ask is you pick one. And I started getting strange comments on my blog and some of my podcasts that said, you know, oh, it's funny you say this now, but you said something totally different about the White Sox in your column. Well, it turns out the Chicago Tribune has a very successful baseball columnist named Paul Sullivan. And so there was some weird little online confusion, especially back in, what was it, 2007, 2008, when I started blogging for real, uh, that people thought I was Paul Sullivan from the Chicago Tribune. So my professional name, 
a lot of, you know, my, my SAG name and the name I had when I directed the film that I directed was my full name because also there was already a Paul Sullivan and SAG, Paul Sullivan and Directors Guild. And so I went by my full name there. So I just said Paul Francis Sullivan. And I just felt that that sounded too pompous. And, but Paul F. Sullivan sounded too much like Paul F. Tompkins, the comedian who I have a passing resemblance to. So I just said, let's went by the full name, Paul Francis Sullivan. And then I say, please call me Sully as a way to disarm the pretentiousness of being called Paul Francis Sullivan. But I'm also kind of vain. Now, Sully is so common, especially amongst native New Englanders. I had three Sullivans in my class in Massachusetts growing up, and none of us were related. Or if we were related, you have to go back to, you know, County Cork. You know, Sullivan is the third most used name in Massachusetts after like Jones and Smith. You can't have a film that takes place in Boston without someone being named Sullivan. Ben Affleck was a Sullivan in Goodwill Hunting. Matt Damon was a Sullivan in The Departed. And so there's so many people named Sully who kind of look like me and sound like me, who grew up in the suburbs of Boston, that the idea of just saying, oh, I'm just Sully, as if it's what, as if I'm Cher, as if I'm Madonna, you know? So, and, and so I just figured I have to make sure that we realize that the Sully that we're referring to is me. I don't want any confusion there. But I also believe that we need, that we Sully's need to reclaim the crown that a Sullivan has to be the King Sully because the most famous Sully in the world, heck, Tom Hanks played him, Clint Eastwood directed a film about him, isn't even a Sullivan. It's a Sullenberger, Captain Sullenberger, who, you know, landed the plane in the, in the river. So, I mean, that's why I introduced myself that way, to differentiate myself from a talented uh, columnist for Chicago Tribune, but also I'm vain. And I kind of want people to know it's me. But thanks for listening, Rachel. Hey, uh, Jeff Cohen, who has been a guest on the podcast, throws a lot of questions my way. I uh, says, strange that Michael Conforto is not signed with any team yet. That is strange. Uh, I think he should go to Cleveland or maybe Miami. Both are teams with good pitching that could use a good solid bat. Um, could it be the draft pick attached to the qualifying offer is hindering the deal? Possibly. Possibly. I'm still not sure how all of that works right now. Uh, but for teams like Cleveland and Miami, a chance to win right now might be worth taking that chance. Um, with the MLB draft scheduled in July, he may miss more than half the season. I really don't think that's going to happen. I think even when you're seeing some injuries like Chicago, the White Sox just had a big injury in their outfield. Someone's going to bring in Conforto. Um, so let's just see. Well, there's a couple other questions um that i got here um oh yeah this is one from scott campbell who's at mtg pack foils who was always sending me good solid questions if the uh blue jays if the deal the blue jays made for Yusek kuchi winds up being the longest deal in mlb in terms of years by opening day are you concerned i would be um the, basically the gist of this question is that we are not seeing players being signed to long-term deals. And with that in mind, does that mean that some of the things that they were fighting for in the lockout are not going to happen? Well, I understand your concern. The bigger concern I have is that we still haven't created a situation where there is an incentive to put a good product on the field, ergo, or at least pay for a good product on the field. I'll get to the whole payroll thing in a little bit. Ergo, we talked a little bit about Baltimore and Pittsburgh and Cleveland not spending any money. Um, I, I do understand if you're a team, you know, you're trying to sign some of these players, you're signing to decent contracts. And yes, some of the deals are a lot shorter than I'm sure some of the players would want. But I, and I'm and believe me, if you remember any of the nightmarish podcasts, at least nightmarish for me to produce 
talking about labor issues, I, I tend to sign with the players. But I do understand the owners being reticent to signing super long-term deals to players, knowing that it could bite them in the derriere. And so maybe with an increased, you know, AAV, with increased value per year, but shorter term, that, that may just make sense. That may not be a sense of collusion from the owners. That may just be, hey, look at we don't want to be stuck with this five, six, seven years from now. And if a player is really good, then maybe they can sign several of these big contracts. Uh, I, as I said, I don't tend to sign with the owners, but just because I want them to pony up and spend on a decent product doesn't mean that I want them to make deals that could be hurtful down the line for them. You know, I'm not so anti-owner and anti-management that I can understand them saying, look, we don't want to commit five, six, seven years to you, but we will pay you well. We will pay you what the market bears. In so many ways, I want the, just the owners to pay what the market bears for the players. And if this is what the market bears for players, fine. I understand not wanting to tie up the team for the long term and saying like, oh God, we're, we're still paying for this contract. He hasn't produced anything in two and a half seasons. I get that. I get that. So for some of you who thought I was way too one-sided on the issue in terms of the you know, players versus the owners, um, I can understand why they may not want to do a deal that is going to be harmful down the line. So I, I don't, I don't look at it as, as such a dire issue. I think the salary floor is a much bigger issue, and one that I can, I really feel like they need to address. Uh, Sam McBride uh, wrote, uh, "I think this is the year the Mariners finally make the playoffs." They have a legitimate lineup this season. There's an extra playoff spot for the grab up for grabs. Let's go, Mariners. Hey, Sam, you know what? I think you're right. I do think the Mariners are going to make the postseason this year. In fact, I know there's another wild card team in the American League. I think they could win the division. I do think the Astros are a little bit worse. I think Correa meant more to that team than some of the stats. And I think that it was kind of a crushing blow to the Astros. Now, there have been many instances of a team losing a key player and, you know, being good the next year. Hell, the year after the Cardinals lost Albert Pujols, they got to Game 7 of the National League Championship Series, and they went to the World Series the very next year. I get it. The Astros are a talented team, and they're probably going to be a, a playoff team. But I like the pitching staff in Seattle, and I think their offense is better. And they were a ninety some. They were a ninety win team last year, and they played a little better than their record should have been. But they had the experience of playing down the stretch and being a very good team. I think Seattle is going to the postseason this year for the first time since two thousand and one, and I believe that would mean that every single major league team would have made the postseason since. 2015 I think that I think that'd be I think I think that'd be correct since 2015 which I think that would be pretty good that would be pretty cool so look at I think that that's a I think that's something I agree with you there you go I agree with you right there now whereas well first of all let's talk a little bit about we're gonna go we have one last one to read through but I'm going to talk to you right now a little bit about Built Bars. Now, Built Bars are the best tasting protein bars out there. And some of us have given up on our New Year's resolutions, but not your pal Sully. I'm sticking with them. I'm sticking with them all the way. And one way I do that is by eating Built Bars. It doesn't feel like a New Year's resolution when you're eating them because they're so delicious. Have you tried the Puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of the best tasting built bars ever. They're the first protein infused marshmallow, and they're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're a treat, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. Puffs are a fan favorite with some incredible flavors. Yummy cinnamon churros, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie. They're so good, they're going to be your new favorite. All built bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Yes, the puffs included. Low calorie. 
high protein. Replace your candy bars with these. They're better. A typical candy bar is going to go from, what, two, 300 calories? Go to Built.com and sc scroll down to the macros chart. And guess what? You're going to be blown away. High protein, low calorie, high fiber, low carb. You know what? Most Built Bars contain 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar, 4 grams of net carb, 17 grams of protein. Compare that with a candy bar, which are usually around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. You got great flavors. You know all about this. They just they, they focus on the taste. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15, get 15% off your order, use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. You may wonder what the heck I'm doing. Here's the deal. I have to plug my computer back in. Do you know why? Because something shorted. This is the least professional podcast I may have ever done in my life. And the fact of the matter is, I'm going through it anyway. <laughs> I'm going to edit some of this out for the uh, audio recording. But for those of you watching on video, you are watching a man who is dealing with some computer issues while I'm recording. And I've had so many issues with my computer trying to record this very podcast that you're witnessing a man doing some behind-the-scenes work just to get this one in the can. That's how much I want to do this podcast for you folks. That's how much. I'm going to pause this for just a moment. All right. Last one, because we're coming off the rails on this podcast. <laughs> you don't even know the behind the scenes of this one. Uh, let's go read it. This is from uh, Ben, my buddy, who's the jazz uh, musician, Panorama Jazz Brass Band, um, who's talking about, uh, commenting on the video, was talking about the money that the Dodgers are spending. He says, it's all about who can afford to buy expensive stars. I mean, probably so. But is there a case made for team play? Don't the Japanese have a concept of wa, which translates to roughly harmony? Probably something you can't quantify. But there is an art to the game, isn't there? Does anybody in baseball keep values, uh, value keeping players together long term to allow that type of chemistry to develop? I would think there could be potentially a competitive advantage. It would take time. In both bands, jazz and brass, we've had consistent core of players for many years, and the music just keeps getting better because the relationships among the players keep evolving. Maybe that's the difference between aesthetics and athletics. Unfortunately, I've been a pretty hopeless athlete. Thanks, and good luck with the allergies. Um, yeah, I think there is something to be said about keeping a core of players together. I think there is. I think there is. You've seen that a little bit with Los Angeles. I think you're seeing that where a you've seen teams keep the band together to a degree. You saw a core from the Giants when they won those titles in the 2010s. And the Yankees. You've seen teams do that and piece a team together where they are consistent and have players that you can rely on. Now. Yes, there are elements of, you know, that there's sometimes the elements of what makes for the good teammate is hard to quantify. And sometimes you're going to see teams that play better than the sum of their parts. I understand what you're saying. And I do think that there comes a point of harmony that, that plays in baseball with winning teams. And you'll see teams that, why, how did this team defeat this star-studded club, and you see teams that have huge payrolls that don't quite click and don't quite fit together. I think it's a combination. You have to have that sense of teamwork. You have to have that sense of unity. But I also think you need to sign some decent players. I think it's the there is always going to be a team that has a star and have role players and other people who spark the team to be a championship team. I think it's not one. I think it's not the other. I think it's a combination. And I think the best teams are the ones that work well, have the 
key of top players, and the rest of the players work well around that. And next thing you know, you have a title. It's just not going to happen with the Baltimore Orioles, buddy. It's just not going to happen. But it may happen with some of the other teams that aren't the big, huge payroll teams, but who's the, the some of their parts will be greater than the individual. Well, some of my thoughts, and again, thank you for dealing with some of the computer issues I had in today's episode. Sometimes that happens, but this show is always going to happen. Thanks so much for making us your first listen, and you can follow us at Lockdown MLB Pods. Same handle for Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Uh, people of Portland, I'm on your side. Hope you get yourself a team. Send me stuff on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and I'll get my computer stuff fixed up, and we'll be we'll be running these podcasts a little more smoothly than this one. But, hey, this was like a homemade cookie. It was a little rough around the edges here, but that's fine because we're still talking baseball, and hopefully this is like a friend hanging out, talking about the ball game. And we got games coming up next week. I'm working on the new In Memoriam video, which is going to be released just before the season begins. This has been Locked On MLB. It's the 30th day of March. We're almost done with March. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.